Yeah. Cha. So good to meet you. Good to meet you too. I love your voice. Oh, thank you. We stalk you on your Instagram. We we regularly yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tend to stalk Haya a whole lot. But you know, I don't give any. I don't. I don't put any likes or anything. She'll know I'm. I'm hack. You know, like I'm sort of. You know, sort of stalking her. I don't want her to know that. Love it. Love it. She's like this international. She's an Emmy uh, award yeah, yeah. winner. Yeah. Yeah. Who who really downplays everything. <laughs> So Elita what do you think about Pakistan what comes to your mind uh okay so the first time i actually uh, so this this is really this is really uh, interesting let me tell you so i actually grew up in the middle east i grew up in saudi arabia yeah and uh, the only country while i was growing up in saudi arabia the only countries that i had visited were bangladesh because i had to come to bangladesh every every year for a vacation and i think we went to london once to meet my aunt and we went to the uae that's it basically so after i come to bangladesh i you know for my higher studies and then i um you know i start working as well. while i was studying i i started to work as well so the first opportunity that i had to go abroad as a journalist like as a media personality basically not only a journalist was pakistan oh. yes and this was in 2000 uh, Seven, six or seven. It's a long time ago, and I, uh, you know, I still remember. I mean, the group that went from Bangladesh, the other journalists from other newspapers and TV stations, we all became so close. You know, we were, oh, we were like one gang exploring Pakistan. You know, and it was beautiful because we, uh, we went to Karachi, we went to Islamabad, uh, we went to Lahore. Oh, I loved Lahore because yes. you see, it is a nice city. It's a beautiful city, and uh, I could relate to it a whole lot. You see, the older part of Lahore is very much similar. Like, if you look at the architecture and the wide uh, roads and streets and everything, very much similar to the older part of Dhaka mm-hmm. as well. Really? So yes, and and also the older part of Delhi. And also, I remember uh, one other part is the uh, the food street. I think it was in Lahore. Not in Karachi. I don't think it was in. No, it was yeah. in. It was in Lahore. Oh. oh, it was beautiful. We went two nights in a row. We stayed. <laughs> we stayed like till wee hours in the morning. I I really liked my um, my trip to Pakistan, and and I think it's also because we got to, I got to connect with a lot of uh, with many older journalists, more experienced journalists, and we kept in touch. Still now. Um, coming to Haya, do you have a story about um, when we talk about Bangladesh or like when it comes to Bangladesh? I also grew up in in Saudi Arabia, uh, so my first uh, what, oh. eight years of my, my life were were in Saudi Arabia. So I think there used to be some interaction with people who were from Bangladesh, but not that much. I think I mean I I would be honest in saying that I think it, at least in a place like Saudi Arabia, the Pakistanis and the and the Bangladeshis <laughs> used to live in their own sort of little silos. <laughs> but I think the first time. i really like you know the like the first time pakistan lost the cricket match uh, against <laughs> bangladesh i think that was the time when i just realized that all right i mean this is like this is like serious now right <laughs> this is serious and this yeah you know yeah and then i mean obviously like and i think pakistan was one of the first countries to actually lose against bangladesh so like we have that history i think uh, of of sort of cricket and then yeah. i i remember i've never been to bangladesh sadly i i mean i wish i could but i guess these days again there are issues with visas yeah. and what not but i feel like i think my first real real like actual proper interaction with with people from bangladesh was on an exchange program where i was in washington dc as a 19 year old and that's where we uh, that's when i uh, spoke to a bunch of like undergraduate students who were also from bangladesh but were visiting dc on the same program and because i was a journalism undergraduate at that time i started to ask them what they were studying about pakistan in their uh, in their sort of social studies so i was really like on an investigation <laughs> sort of <laughs> i was really on an investigation trip and i remember that i think one of my 
very first contributions to a magazine as an as a budding journalist or as a as an aspiring journalist was actually a piece where i spoke to young people from bangladesh who were these new made newly made friends that i had and i just basically like we just ended up publishing an article in a in a, in a youth magazine in pakistan just stating what you know what what people on the other side you know read read about us and i remember that was also my first uh, uh brush with censorship because i remember like the editor of the magazine say telling me that you know well there's a lot that can be published but then there's a few sentences we'd rather not publish because like the state wouldn't be happy you know? <laughs> so 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 yeah so so my my intrigue about bangladesh you know started off when i was 19 <laughs> both of you work in tales to tell story like to dig up stories to tell stories like how do you how do you find those stories like how do you how do you happen to find those interesting stories that you you tell um maybe alita you can um, if you like to well uh as journalists i think you 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 do find a way to look for stories because you know you're you're uh you know you're just not sitting it's not a desk job you you have to be going around using your resources and your network uh to look for stories you have to uh this is like i don't know gen- journalism 101 201 haya would know this better since she studied it <laughs> but um you know i i learned on the job so i would say for me when i started journalism i was when i started working i was 19 i started working um uh, because i needed pocket money i never figured i mean i never realized that uh, i would end up doing this for more than 17 years so and at the same uh, organization but uh, i think uh, what i realized quite early uh, in my career is that uh, anything and ev- anything positive can be a good story you know mm-hmm. it it just depends on uh, which platform you want to place it mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. you know not everything can be a front page story not everything can be a back page story but then there are nice stories that that can go in i'm still talking about paper all right i mean you know obviously in the digital uh, now that everything is digital everything is front page or everything is you know it all depends on um, how popular or how viral a particular story gets but you know i started off with a newspaper uh, and, and the newspaper still exists we are still working in the newspaper so uh, i'm saying this because for people who are watching uh you, you know there are many people there are many young people who would like to become journalists yeah. uh so i i would rather use this opportunity opportunity to say that being a journalist and being a writer are two different things altogether yeah so i have met a lot of young people who come to me and who come to my uh, you know who approach my colleagues and they're like we uh we want to uh be journalists okay so why do you want to be a journalist because i write good english and she probably does or he probably does i understand the language well and you know you're an english newspaper you're an english daily i think i i should get a job here or at least i should try but you know just knowing the language and just writing at a de- you know like you know you're at a desk and you have a laptop you know just writing a story or you know anything that comes to your mind is really not journalism for a journalist you have to go down i mean you know you have to uh you know get outside your building mm-hmm. and look for stories and and also I, i i would like to add so what are stories exactly so um see as i said i i whenever i go uh, to a country i've i've visited many many countries i i always tend to visit the older part of that particular city because i think these older parts of cities have lots of stories have lots of you know these generations of families living here they know how a particular uh, establishment uh, came up in that uh, in that on that particular street so these are things that that's very interesting and these are stories as well uh, i'm i'm talking about features for magazines and you know like lighter stories uh, of course there are political debates going on there are uh, uh, you know uh, debates going on uh, between policy makers as well there are opinion pages where you can actually give your opinions uh, for editorials as well so i think for for to be a journalist the thing that i would like to stress on is just sitting and writing a story in that particular language is not enough you mm-hmm. would have to go out and look for stories you have to talk about other people 
uh, the struggles of other people, the success stories of other people. I think that's that's what's really interesting, and that's what uh, readers would like to uh, to know and read about. Sorry, Zip. Okay, so uh, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> I picked up on something that you said. Uh, so you said anything positive can make a good story. Um, so I read an article that you had written about uh, Tali, uh, something in Bengali you had written uh, that said that you can't clap with one hand and it was about yeah. rape. But yeah. also that the stories that I've seen Haya um, document, and yesterday I saw a very heavy one, uh, but it made me realize the darker side of things and oh my God, it was so heavy Haya. <laughs> the, uh, the living dead watch? of uh, the, the one on <laughs> Edi, uh, oh, you know, like okay, yeah. uh, it, it's just going behind the scenes and seeing, of course, you picked up on a positive. There was a positive there. There is somebody doing the work that nobody else is doing. Uh, but yet it was so sad uh, to know that this is, uh, sorry, we live in our bubbles. Uh, uh, we live a very privileged life. We don't realize what happens in it. And, you know, like, I'm thankful that you, people like you make uh, open our eyes. So if your article and your stories. And uh, so what would you say about uh, how do you get your inspiration? Where, where do you come from? Uh, where do you see those uh, stories begin? Is it something that bothers you, Haya? Like, like when you see something happening, something bothering you, and then you. Yeah, I think I think how I seek my inspiration for stories is uh, is through a genuine uh, love for just knowing what's happening, uh, and not just not not just knowing like through Twitter or like you know oh. knowing through through social media uh, okay. or knowing through what the famous people are talking about, but actually like what's going on on the streets. Uh, I remember like one of my old, old professors used to say that, you know, when, if you want to become a storyteller, she used to specifically talk in the sense of a journalist, but I think I applied to all storytellers. She used to say that, you know, if you, if you want to become a good journalist, you need to take your antennas out. So, and, and, and I feel like, yeah, your antennas should be out. I feel like I, I really get inspiration from, from the, from whatever's happening around us on a daily life basis. I really seek inspiration, a lot of, like a lot of inspiration from just from just having conversations with people who are unknown, people who are um, people who are often not spoken to, also uh, like the person driving your cab and people yeah. like those, you know. And it's uh, because I feel like even you know we live very privileged lives. We we hang out with people who are who think like us, who talk like us, who wear clothes like us. Um, we are very much you know um, products of the class system that we live in. And right. So if I'm from a middle class family, I'd probably just have a lot of friends just from that one particular, you know, sort of sector of people. Um, so I feel like um, I really draw inspiration from from people who are just uh, who are just not considered like special, you know, uh, by by your mass media or your ma mainstream media. We're only the, the famous or the known or the rich sort of, you know, it's, they essentially take up all the space. Um, and I feel like uh, I really, I, mean, I really enjoy conversations. Um, uh, Elita and I have had many, <laughs> you know, on our brief trip together. And I feel like, uh, uh, I feel like, I mean, yeah, just like talking to people, uh, 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 having, like, I think, like, having interest in walking a lot, just like walking and then yeah. randomly asking a very random question to, to someone who you meet. Uh, I think people are often taken aback, but people, uh, you'll be surprised, you know, how many people are actually willing to talk to you when, when you just ask like a small yeah. question to them. Uh, but in terms of like, uh, you know, stories that are, uh, that are like, that are heavy, but then they may also have, you know, something, something positive in it. I feel like, I mean, I mean, I think I've always struggled with this question more so because I think there's a lot of hate that comes to people uh, like me and many others who are, you know, who are much more senior and more uh, have been in the industry for, for longer, whether it's a documentary filmmaker or whether it's other people like lawyers and, you know, and, and human rights activists and all of those people. And I'm pretty sure that's the same case across South Asia. It's not a very Pakistani phenomenon. There's a lot of like 
there's a lot of insecurity among people about how like there are these people who get our negative stories out into the world uh, which i obviously i mean you know like i never agreed with it which is why i continue sort of telling all kinds of stories but i think recently also i think especially in the light of this pandemic which has given us so much time to just think and sit with ourselves you know like even when we li- look at our lives right now it's such a mix of you know happy and sad it's like you know one day it's hopeful the other day you hear something bad about some loved one going through a tough time financially health wise you know we all heard of so many deaths around us and you know it's such a happy and sad sort of balance and it's really up to us about how we look at it i mean we can sit with the despair or we can you know be tone deaf and become extra hopeful but it's such a balance that i feel like it's the same with documentaries or with any kind of journalism that people do that it's always going to be a balance and it's always going to be multiple layers you know no stuff can no story can just be 100% happy and no no story can just be 100% sad because we as humans are not 100% this or 100% that so how can we expect our stories to do you know to only be because in that heavy documentary there is so much hope that wow there is this bunch of crazy people who are saving who are saving the the the, the dignity of dead people right mm-hmm. um and then on a bad day if you watch it you can you know like you probably be depressed like watching that film and and so many of the other works that all of us keep creating so i feel like it's it's such a uh, it's a balance that we need to retain uh Uh, and you can't just chase happiness or you can't just chase misery you know in your documentary filmmaking in your storytelling like it's like everyone like is multi-layered and so should our stories you know <laughs> i totally agree with hi and i can so relate to that because um <clears throat> you know uh, the brief time that hi and i and you know all the ladies we spent <laughs> time together in in kazakhstan i think i did notice this about um but about haya in particular and i think all journalists whether they're they make documentaries or whether they write or whatever i mean you know the different using the different platforms to to uh, express yourself or to tell your story uh, what what happens is that at that particular point in time something happens you know you you hear something or you mm-hmm. you hear someone say something and or you see something and you're like okay this is not right you know you, something has to be done for this you know we have to sh- tell people that this is not right so you, either you show it you show the visuals or you write about it or you know okay something good is happening in the midst of all this negativity and i would like to show that as well uh, masumo was talking about the article that i wrote a few days ago it was it was actually an editorial and it was about this really famous person in bangladesh who spoke about how women should dress mm-hmm. so that and uh, only then can they be uh protected or you know they can be saved from the evil of rape and sorry yeah, and, and let me interject that that's not just bangladesh it, it's such everywhere. males are here also everywhere everywhere <laughs> in so, power you know, this is something that we have been experiencing for years this is something this is not not a new phenomena you know so why did i write about this last week because uh the last one month or so lots of stories and reports have been coming in about rapes you know uh these uh, little boys getting raped in the madrasas yeah, uh, six year six, six year old uh, uh, girls getting raped and then uh, this particular uh, this newly married couple who you know, who was roaming about the city the wife got raped while the husband was you know uh, uh, tied tied down and you know so these kind of stories were coming and it's and uh, they're making you angry and they're you know you you want to say something and when something like this happens a famous person who a lot of people look up to you know says something like uh, sisters i want you to uh, dress properly do not dress like the the women you you see on uh, you watch on television or the movies he's a movie star himself by the way a producer and a director but uh, <laughs> I no, that's it, funny <laughs> and that and that is that works as a trigger i think and then you need to really get into the story and you start uh, you know bringing subplots it's so important that you tell those stories and i think it also brings um sort of the question up like how do you navigate it yourself through the field of your work especially like now we're focusing heavily on journalism like um so what's your connection to actually being a woman seeing certain stories um reporting on those stories because like what hi also says okay we have a certain privilege so you know that allows us to report on certain stories 
but also you yourself as a private person, as a woman, like how do you feel you, um, you know, what's your feeling or experience that you want to share with um, anyone, um, mm -hmm. like being a woman in that particular field or in your particular environment um, work really? I think, uh, I think the one thing that I would say is being a woman or, okay, so being female and, and uh, it's not only in the field of journalism. I think even today, there are many kinds of challenges that um, women do face uh, in, well, in, in, in countries of South Asia, I think. Uh, I'm not sure about, uh, I'm not sure if Masuma and uh, Haya would agree, but that's what happens in, in Dhaka at least, or in Bangladesh, or any of the other places that I've been to in South Asia. Here too. Me, yeah, you're, you're walking down the street and, uh, and you feel like, you know, you're, you know, you're thinking and, you know, you're, you're doing something, you're, you're listening to music or whatever, and you're thinking and suddenly you hear someone say something really nasty. And you understand that it's, you know, it's, uh, it's something thrown at you. But, you know, and similarly, how women throughout generations have been building this wall around them when they're walking or they're getting on a rickshaw or, you know, they're traveling at night or, you know, they have to work late. So I think this, uh, this wall is still there. It's not, there are probably cracks, absolutely, because I think uh, slowly and steadily the work environment is getting better. But let me tell you something, Samira, as a woman, or um, as a, I think as a woman, the newsrooms in, uh, in newspaper offices all over the world, mm -hmm. you know, uh, lots of changes have actually happened. Mm -hmm. This is a very old idea, but I would like to share it with you. So when the newsroom was, was actually uh, dominated by men only, and this is something, I, I think I read this uh, uh, about a, a newspaper office in New York, and it was probably in the 50s or the 60s. The stories would be valued accordingly, you know? Mm -hmm. It was only after women began to work, uh, you know, in, in the forefront with news that stories of rape, actually started to cover more column inches and stories of rapes and sexual harassment would probably come on the first page or the, or the back page. But before that, before the woman actually had a point of view to share, uh, these stories, not generally, but this is something that I had read uh, from, I think I had read, read it in uh, the Times of, uh, uh, the, the New York Times probably a few years ago. I, I, I thought it was really interesting how a woman can actually come and share her, her idea and how she sees the world because it's obviously it's different from a man. So as a result, I would say, Jay, as a woman, I was always, I also saw the world in a way probably my male colleagues couldn't or didn't. Uh, this one story that I did, uh, it, I, had to, I had to go to the border, uh, one of the border cities in Bangladesh, Benapol. It's a really long ride. And I think it borders with, I'm not sure which, which uh, part of, uh, which city of India, but uh, it's a very uh, critical area because, you know, lots of crimes take place there. So one of the biggest crimes that, uh, that used to happen, I don't know if they still happen or not, I'm sure they do, trafficking teenage uh, uh, girls, you know, teenagers through the border and they would work uh, in the brothels in Mumbai Happens. And in Delhi and, and all these places. So, um, so what happened was luckily uh, an NGO in India, in West, in West Bengal, and an NGO in, um, I think in Benapol, they worked together to rescue around 27 young teenagers and they were brought back, you know, to, to Benapol. So I went to visit these girls and I actually spent, uh, I spent a night with them. I, I uh, visited with probably like three or four girls because most of the girls weren't willing to come and talk to us. Mm -hmm. They were all probably like what, 16 or 17, and they were kidnapped when they were 13 or 12 or 14, you know? So uh, I remember most of the girls who I was talking to, they were uh, very tight-lipped. The parents were telling them, you know, the parents were answering on behalf of them. Uh, they did not want a lot of information to be uh, shared with, with the journalists. So I had to really, sit and talk to her and you know have tea together and everything and these little you know these little homes they were living in like uh i i, I had never really experienced something like this before it was a 
uh, you know, a, a big stretch of land and these little, 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 like small sized homes and a full family of seven or eight or 12 would live in one such home. And uh, so they asked me to sit there. They gave me tea. They gave me biscuits, you know, and they were telling me their stories in, in their own way. But what I could figure out is that when they were kidnapped, the parents were obviously uh, very worried and they would pray every day. They would cry. They would go crazy for the kids. But once they returned, most of the girls weren't really allowed to step out of their homes because now people, everybody would know that, okay, so she was a sex worker uh, in, a, in a brothel. So she's not going to school. She's not going out to play with the other kids. She's not going out to fetch water or do other chores. She's just stuck at home. So these are, I think, uh, challenges that girls and women face. Uh, I don't know if it's sexist of me to say this, but I think only other women can actually understand this properly. I'm sure men can empathize too. with it. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, this is something that hit me so hard that I actually went and I did the story. I came back, I submitted the story, and a year later, I actually won the Red Cross International Award for this particular story. Oh wow! Okay, that's, that's excellent. That's something that I'm really, yeah. <laughs> you know, very um, proud okay. of. I'm finding this uh, interview so uh, interesting talking to you both of you. So, hi, are you mentioned that there is a lot of hate? Uh, so, you know, like uh, in the sense that people react badly when you're portraying your country badly. So A, I would like you to talk about that. Uh, what have you faced? And B, uh, the question that came to mind is that you are behind the camera, whereas uh, Elita yeah. at times is uh, in front of the camera because she's the singer. So does your writing, uh, uh, you know, uh, like you wrote about this act, yeah. actor who uh, spoke about rape. Um, when people see you singing, do they uh, you bring that forth? Uh, like people who might agree with that actor, do they bring that emotion forth and uh, judge you not only for your singing? Don't see only right. that. So I want both of you to answer. Uh, Haya, you first. Yeah, go ahead. So um, I think, yes, the hate is, I mean, the hate keeps coming. Uh, it usually, you know, intensifies only when we do something big, like internationally. And that's when people just like, oh, look at these people. Otherwise, you can really be, you know, in your, you know, like, basically just like be in your own zone and keep working and no one really uh, bothers, uh, at least people like me. But um, also, I think because I don't have like a huge Twitter presence, I don't like really let my opinions be known to people about what I think about what happened yesterday in the country or in the city. Um, and I feel like that's part of part of me uh, is not interested in it because I don't like no, nobody likes being hated upon, <laughs> obviously. So I don't <laughs> yeah. want to, I don't want to invite like extra toxicity into my life by just like making all of my thoughts public and hence drive a certain kind of, you know, audience towards me. Some of the people will obviously, I know like they love me for my opinions, but then some people are going to be, you know, openly hateful towards like towards me because of my opinions. And, you know, like there's so much to do there's only 24 hours in the day. There's like five different projects that you need to meet deadlines of. It, there's really like no space for that. But also, I think also journalistically, I think like many of us have been trained to, you know, not our, no, to not let our opinions be known because, you know, that directly affects how people see your actual journalistic work or actual documentary work as well. So I think in the corner of my mind, there's that sort of notion as well, um, which is very much existent that, you know, like, I mean, like, like with regard, like your, like maybe the world really doesn't need to know what you think because what what you think about something or how you feel about something is actually very much you know reflective in the films that that I make or that my peers make. You can't really not know what I'm thinking about something if you watch the the work you know that 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 I've made and that applies to I think most documentary filmmakers. But also um, in terms of uh, but also like you know in the beginning like you know you get a shock when you start getting that hate initially it's it's very it can be very disturbing it can be very shocking um but then it also depends on you know what kind of people you surround yourself with you know if you have friends um who are not from the industry and if you have friends who who help you who help you not take that very seriously and who help you realize that it's really just some troll online and you know like we're all above and beyond it um, i think that really helps because i feel like if my parents you know and my parents have definitely you know read some of the hate comments that that have come my way in the past 
and they become very disturbed and they try to tell me to be careful right but then you need some truly like um you need some really badass friends in your life who can just say that you know what like can you stop can you basically not take this seriously and can you also just move on and then they 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 just don't tell you to move on they basically help you move on you know by by just having like a like a fun conversation a happier conversation i think that really helps because i feel like um people uh, from uh, from like people from our parents generation i think they 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 can see the hate because they also consume social media but they don't really know exactly what to make of it so they take every comment too seriously while i think our generation really needs to be trained in how not to take everything seriously and how obviously you know if you're being threatened you need to take it seriously but if it's just some random comment on the clothes that you're wearing you know like we really need to train ourselves in sort of de- you know in deleting all the negativity because it really counts to nothing but just like extra anxiety extra worries in in your life but i feel like when you when you when you did ask uh, elita the question about you know being being a public figure in terms of being a singer and then but then also being like a journalist um i personally have struggled a lot with it because you know in the beginning like when i was making documentaries i used to make sure that i i did not openly support any cause i did not you know i did not conduct fundraisers on 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 sort of causes that i supported or institutions that i liked uh, whose work i liked because i felt like i could not be financially or morally or you know publicly supporting any any agenda of any organization but i think you know like 10 years on into this industry i've just realized that you know like you can't like it's it's impossible for human beings to be completely objective yeah. so it's better that you let your positive biases known at least you know uh, and 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 use your sort of privilege as a responsibility not as a burden but actually use it as as a responsibility and put the put put a good word out for for people or for institutions or causes that you that you feel strongly for because um as much as there is hate you know it's always very uh heartening to see that there's also a lot of support and the thing is that the haters come out and they write a hateful comment but the supporters are usually silent and you usually only see their support when you ask them for help when you set a target that you know i like we, me and my friends need to collect this much money for this cause for these schools being built and you will see you know like you'll see the target yeah. being reached in 3 days when you had imagined that it'll probably take a whole month to do that right so yeah. so now i become very shameless on that front and i don't <laughs> like if i if i feel good about some people or if i feel good about some institutions i just openly go out and support it because i feel like um i have uh like i have that flexibility in life because i i'm not associated with a daily newsroom i'm an independent documentary filmmaker i feel like i have the luxury to to go public with you know what what i sometimes or who i align with uh, whereas i feel like if you're a full time journalist and if you you know associated with a particular organization and a, a particular news organization i think those that becomes slightly difficult because the conflict of interest comes in and all of those things absolutely well said hmm. it's, it's interesting to hear how you deal with those like positive and negative putting yourself out there you know not putting yourself out there like finding the balance i think like it's it's really it's really helpful because even we who like our generation who grew up with social media i feel like we're heavily struggling with that right because like there is this and i think elita you can also like relate to that because um you know in order to sort of like be successful as a singer like you automatically put yourself out there it's like inevitable right So how do you feel the social media world has been for you as an experience like throughout the years um like how have you you know managed that in in all those different layers that I've talked about So <clears throat> Samira I'm actually from the older generation not from the social media generation <laughs> where my music is concerned <laughs> actually so I'm actually uh, so my music got Uh, popularity and gained a lot of you know gained a lot of popularity and i uh, rose to fame uh, when social media wasn't really a thing you know so people would buy cds people would uh, oh, wow. watch concerts yeah so i i started off in the early 2000s so uh, even though there were, yes there was internet and email and all that but you know the the power of social media wasn't really you know there to haunt you all the time like how it is now right i think if 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 i had actually uh started uh working as a musician or as a singer uh now like after 2005 or you know like post 2010 i think i would have a really really hard time 
because it's it's actually quite depressing social media because you know it's just out there and people just listen to one song or they read one one report or they you know they just read one story a fiction or they watch something and then you know they it just takes them two seconds to uh you know write their judgment down and for a lot of creative people it it's actually i would say it's very harmful I, social media is helpful you know it is it's i cannot put it down i cannot um, uh say you know uh, without social media the world would be a better place i don't think i can actually say that because it's because of social media that the women the other night to protest the antiquated rape laws in in bangladesh they you know they were like this city is ours dhaka city is ours who's going to come and stop us so they actually they uh, they arranged they organized a march a peaceful march after 11 pm at night something that obviously most women won't do you know they just even most men you know unless you have something you know you're not going to go out you know uh, wandering at night after work uh, it's not you know you don't do that anymore but what if you do what if you want to what if you just want to go for a walk it's it's so much unsafe if you are a woman and uh, obviously this is not only in dhaka i'm sure uh, in many countries people actually face this so it was this was promoted through social media through facebook through insta videos um and then you know on twitter uh, they even had a hashtag so i think social media is positive when you want to change something when you're a change maker social media and you know so basically you have to use it wisely you know if you're an artist you use the social media to promote your work to have conversations to to you know to have dialogues to simply have fun with friends and family you know but if you use social media for to hurt people to uh you know generate uh you know hurt and uh, these sentiments amongst people that would lead to a war and you know a mob going and you know doing something insane that's when you know that you know this something uh, as fun and creative and good as social media is also being misused and that is that is what happens that is still what's happening uh so as i said as a singer and also as a as a journalist i'm, I'm actually coming so it was in the early 2000s uh when i started off and uh, luckily i had done a lot of stage shows back then which is why maybe some people still remember me even if i'm not very active on social media but <laughs> but yeah uh, uh, and uh, answering masuma's question which she had asked a while ago it uh, yes it does affect me a lot because there are people uh, who are who's probably not going to uh, you know appreciate my song or a video that i made even if they like it because they feel that the opinion that ha- that i had written as a journalist the other day is um you know something that they do not agree to they don't they don't agree with you know but then as haya said you know there is also a number a huge number of people who do show a lot of love and support you know um even if they don't know you they're like okay so uh, you know she has written something or she's done something for the generation for the future for the young people uh this is something that we really need to share maybe i don't agree with everything she says every everything she she talks about but this particular article or this particular video that she made this needs to you know go out to people people from all walks of life so i think you know there are people it all depends on the way you you've been bred actually i'm sorry to sound like an auntie but i think it's the way it it all depends on your upbringing all right okay and by the way hi uh, uh, alita yeah. i heard your singing yesterday and right. i was most pleasantly surprised uh, because you don't sing in falsetto so in pakistan uh, <laughs> most of us don't sing in falsetto i've hardly heard uh, female singers singing in falsetto but in right. uh, across the border we only hear falsetto and i i was quite amazed at your scale and your range and you just kept going higher and higher you started pretty low and i was like okay she's okay uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> so it was it was really amazing thank you when we um contacted you for this project and you sort of like heard about the concept you know like having this conversation um <clears throat> what what were your first thoughts like what made you par- like participate or you know agree on like joining this call even though you didn't weren't 100% sure what is coming but you kind of like read the concept um hi maybe like i don't know if you have 
it's like an attack question Aya. if you have yeah. something in your mind <laughs> i really feel like uh, you know as as someone from pakistan uh, i feel like uh, there's a lot of conversation between pakistan and india even though you know it's it it is tried to sort of you know uh, people try to silence it you know like but i feel like pakistan and india have such a troubled but long history uh, that people you know like the people from both countries are i mean they may not still be on the same page per se but like there's this realization that more, more good and less harm can happen if the two if people from the from both countries start talking more right but i actually personally don't see that at all hap- like usually happening between pakistan and bangladesh i mean obviously there are art exchanges there used to be journalist exchanges on which you know on one of which uh, elita basically came to pakistan but nowadays i think for the past decade pakistan and bangladesh especially don't really enjoy like amazing relations and obviously like i mean you know it's not just something related to like these past 10 years obviously like you know the trouble lies in in the in the mutual and then the divided histories of the two countries and how you know uh, how uh one country still thinks that the other country like a lot of people in pakistan i mean obviously they have to admit that bangladesh is a free country and an, an independent country but i feel like deep down like there's lots of strong biases like you know against people people from bangladesh because um, i feel like i mean we have really not been taught history the right way so we really believe in like you know some jingoistic national like hyper nationalist versions of history and uh, you know people really don't read about what really went wrong and you know and 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 what all wrong like did you know did our sort of ancestors do um so there's this you know so there's a blackout right like between pakistan and india like there's still like a sense of equality in the sense that both nations kind of know that there was something wrong but with bangladesh i mean it's just like i don't think most pakistanis even bother to you know to learn about about what actually happened and about you know about this very beautiful countries you know struggle for independence and people like you know like you will see a lot of pakistanis just say like even after a cricket match you know if bangladesh wins a match against pakistan a lot of people will say oh yeah well they were once pakistan right i mean yeah dude like yeah bro but then that doesn't cut it you know it is it is an independent country and very much so it is an independent country because you were not paying attention at the right time <laughs> what was what was happening right and you did a lot of like not so amazing things right so so i feel like i like the the reason why i was drawn to this conversation was also because i really wish that not just on this sort of platform but i really wish that there is more conversation between pakistan and bangladesh i feel like the conflict is old enough for us to discuss but i feel like there's still a lot of survivors right and there's still a lot of eyewitnesses who who are alive on both sides you know in bangladesh obviously so much more so but also in pakistan right and so a lot of our elders i feel are like are are still like they either don't want to talk about it or they only want to talk about it like from a very sort of bitter point of view and i feel like people like me you know who were not around when And, you know when 1971 was happening let's say or when the independence struggle was happening i feel like it's up to people like me at least in my country to to sort of just try to change the narrative and you can't change narratives in one day like this one conversation maybe maybe can't change anything but it's just that we need to be more available um, to sort of you know to like opportunities like this because i really don't see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, like conversations happening between the two countries there is definitely like this willingness especially uh, on my side of south asia uh, to not discuss it you know to just brush it under the, under the carpet and you brush it under the carpet when you know that you know like we're kind of on the wrong side of history sometimes yeah. so 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 i i i genuinely believe in that i don't see you know like pakistan and india i think there's also at least north india and many parts of pakistan are connected by a similar language because urdu and hindi right. are very similar you know bollywood is a huge connector uh, as much as it is very imperialistic in nature as well but i feel like <laughs> it's if you look around like you know it it becomes harder to find connections Uh, present day connections between pakistan and india i'm oh, sorry between pakistan and bangladesh you know uh, there were a lot of singers back in pakistan who then moved to bangladesh when bangladesh you know uh, gained independence but like i feel like at some point like that's the only connection i have you know like we i just know like some artists and some actors on my fingertips who shared this who had this shared history and then 
suddenly nowadays i don't like you know i don't have like i don't know like mm-hmm. what can connect us uh, even though there seems to be many things because south asian cultures are very, very unique but they're very similar and like the way we live and the way like i mean i think so much is like so much can be done uh, which really like you know i i was really like uh, like an, a little excited puppy when i read that you know like <laughs> finally there's something between these two countries because we really need to start talking guys it's 2020 like it's yeah. it's high time <laughs> honestly you're so right uh, i i know this is not about this but i discovered uh, you're so right that we are not willing to look into the history uh, so uh, i i am one of those people who is very deeply connected to bangladesh right now because i my family had businesses there and all my relatives had businesses so there were these multiple i am a gujarati so gujaratis had businesses ah. there yeah so um, and and uh now i'm collecting narratives because i discovered just last year what had happened i had just been a victim of textbook history and when i did discover now i've gone into it totally and i'm collecting narratives and i'm working on my art and it's changing so yeah uh, i think that dialogue makes a lot of difference you know when i met samira and i haven't met her uh, we just met over the net but it's such a good connection and and i feel that uh, conversations will diffuse matters new conversations new relationships because we've all suffered uh, my family has suffered greatly but uh, but we need to get over it we need to see what we've done wrong what our army did wrong and get over it step over so how did you both meet uh we didn't really meet as such this is the first time we're seeing each other are you talking about haya or something yeah else? you and haya you and haya oh well okay so haya and i we uh, we we went to this uh, conference in kazakhstan earlier this year right before the last COVID- last year actually it's been almost a year now we went in november 2019 oh we did yeah. oh, ages right. one year oh my ages. god oh, almost <laughs> yeah. so yeah so we were we were there we had a lot of fun we had uh, some workshops that we attended and then we uh, we did some sightseeing together and uh, and then we uh, we flew to um, uae the airport the dubai airport together and then from there we had to part ways yeah, <laughs> yeah my my first meeting with elita was at the airport where i basically said, like you know i kind of marveled at the power of the bangladeshi passport because i had to get it like <laughs> done earlier on with like an hiv test and god knows what and then elita was just just like smartly filling like a visa on arrival form and i was like guys like, oh my god <laughs> these people and that their too. power you know? <laughs> So I was just like, wow. I mean, yeah. I was just like, I really like wish like my passport had more power that evening. You know. <laughs> May I add something? Um, yes. Regarding please. what Masuma and Haya so beautifully expressed mm. a while ago. So, uh, see, when I was living in Saudi Arabia, I had Indian neighbors, I had Pakistani neighbors, and I had Bangladeshi neighbors. And it's it's like, uh, Haya, where did you live in in, in Saudi Arabia? I, I, was, I used to live in the Mam. Oh, I live in the mom too. I'm from Daran. Yeah, I live. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, Just for the uh, record, my husband also lived in the mom. Are oh, you guys oh, all neighbors? Oh okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my thing was a little different because I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Bangladeshi going to an Indian school mm, with, you know, and I, I would lead like different lives because uh, when I would come uh, in in at school, I studied Indian history, Indian geography. uh you know i was taught to draw the in the map of india <laughs> and i can uh, still do that. <laughs> um and uh because i could sing i would always lead the uh, national anthems we had to sing mm. two national anthems the saudi and the indian at school so so you know and, and all that and then i would come back home and there my parents would be preparing for the pohela boishak the you know the bangladeshi festivals uh uh the bangladesh independence day and then you know the, all these special days for Bang- because my family was really into music and organizing uh you know uh, small musical galas and everything for uh, the bangladeshis around so you know i actually grew up in in this multicultural kind of an environment where i was taught that culture and because culture between uh you know music is actually very universal 
right? Mm. So it didn't matter whether I was singing uh, an Indian national, uh, a patriotic song for their 50th, marking their 50th independence year. I was in, I think, ninth grade or something or 10th grade. And I was singing in front, in front of a huge crowd. Or whether I was, you know, um, uh, you know, talking about or listening to a poem about Bongo Bundhu, uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, when we are doing a Bangladeshi program, or whether I'm talking with my Pakistani neighbors in the building and playing and, you know, they're talking in Urdu and in, and in Bangla and I'm speaking in Bangla and Urdu as well, you know, it didn't really matter to me because for me, life was a mixture back then when I was growing up. Uh, when I came to Bangladesh, but then it was only when I visited Pakistan that I understood that history is actually written. Uh, I, I actually experienced history in three different ways because the Bangladeshi, there, there was a Bangladeshi history, there's a Pakistani history, and then there's history in India as well, which is also like another, like from another third angle altogether. Totally so, different you know, perspective. Totally, totally different. So you don't know what exactly, so I'm like, okay, so 1971 has like three different perspectives according to the textbooks. But as Haya and Masuma mentioned, there are survivors. There are real stories. You know, you don't need textbooks. You don't need books mm. to actually understand what happened in 1971. You, know? uh, you have all these people and you have all these organizations now trying to get these stories out uh, so that, you know, there, there, there was a genocide. And, you know, so that people outside the country can actually learn about the ge genocide. So it's quite... Uh, nice when you hear someone like Haya and Masuma saying that, you know, they would like to learn more and they, they learned about it very, Masuma said she learned about it recently and they, right. they're very, open, very, very open to this. I think, uh, uh, you know, history is written in a certain way in all countries, but when, when dialogues happen between human beings, between people, uh, when you can actually draw a common ground, I think these kind of dialogues can actually open hearts and open minds and let you see uh, so much that you've never imagined before. I would like to mention someone's name, um, a, a very famous lawyer, a Pakistani lawyer who, who passed away a few years ago, Asma Jahangir. Asma Jahangir. Yeah, and she was, she was so popular in Bangladesh. She actually came to Bangladesh a few times and I attended her conferences. I interviewed her as well. That was a long time ago. A few she years also ago. won one of your awards. She also won an award in Bangladesh. And it yeah. was only when I met her that I understood that there, there are people, uh, you know, there are many, many Pakistanis who are probably, who were on, on our side, you know, who fought uh, in their own way and they were on our side because um, uh, Asma Jahangi showed me some pictures. I had seen some pictures where uh, back, in, back during, uh, during the liberation war, she and her family and her friends were actually uh, protesting the war in the streets. So this is something that you don't really hear, hear about. It, I only heard about it when I met Asma Jahangir. Mm -hmm. Then there's another family uh, living in Dhaka, very close to me, whose um, mother and grandmother, uh, they're, uh, they're Pakistanis. And they actually, uh, they were also like Asma Jahangir, protesting uh, the war. And they, they were also given the same award. So there, this will happen only if we have positive dialogues and positive conversations between friends. So... Samira, when you asked me to do this, uh, this, this dialogue, and uh, immediately I told you about Haya. I'm like, you know, can we have Haya in the conversation? Because Haya and I had a connection, and I was like, okay, you know what? This is someone that we can actually have a dialogue, I can have a dialogue with. I was like, you know, let's have Haya, a like-minded person, so that we can, we can actually talk. <laughs> yeah, I, I really... I've heard a lot about you, uh, a lot of good things about you from your students, though. Oh, really? They, they yeah. love you. Who, oh, wow. who, who, to whom I regularly I... teach the, the, Bengali uh, the Bengali language movement every year as a matter of principle. So they, <laughs> I try to teach them that at the age of 18. That's 18. quite gutsy so, of you, Aya. It's got to be done. <laughs> got to be done, yeah. <laughs> I want to talk so much more with you guys. I think we should, yeah, we should literally do this some other time if you guys have the time. <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. Just uh, over tea, you know, not, not yeah, a recorded totally. podcast. Totally, not a recorded. <laughs> I, I agree. Maybe, maybe we should just fix a time just to talk, you know? Please, yeah, we should. Yeah, I'm really. down for that. Yeah. I'm totally yeah. down let's, for that. Let's do it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I was really okay. nice seeing you. Likewise. Uh, Likewise. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all for Asma, your time. It was fun talking to you and let's just let's just uh, exchange some Bangladesh notes. If you mm-hmm. we if should you remember really do this. Uh, yeah. let, let's do no, that. no, I'm taking a narrative of my chachi uh, who lived in Bangladesh. And although she went through a very tough time, she was Mujib's neighbor and Sophia uh, Kamal's neighbor. Ah, in Hanmundi wow. 32. Okay. Yeah, so mm-hmm. she, uh, uh, in her conversations, she says, Phir Mukti ne aisa kiya, phir, uh, Mukti ne humko mara. But she, in the same line, she'll say, you know, uh, char ghar down Mujib rehta tha. Wo bahut acha admi tha. Oh, uh, Sophia so. Kamal rehta tha. Sophia Kamal's uh, uh, son actually uh, uh, took refuge in her house when the Mukti was searching for him. Uh, so, so there was all this going on, huh. all this garbar gotala. So, and she took refuge in Sophia Kamal's house. So, so it's a confusing story, but I'm trying to get around to all these narratives. Please let me know if I can help with some more narratives because there are a lot of people here. If you would like, really? if it's, if, yeah, yeah, if it's yeah, yeah. you're doing, let me know. I can yeah. probably, yeah, you more, more. totally. Okay, we'll we'll get in touch. <laughs> sure, okay. sure. Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Okay, so guys, thank you. Thank bye. You. Bye-bye. bye bye.